um, and it's, it's great to, to be presenting at this forum. Uh, so what I want to do today is just really show how metabolic phenotyping can help us uh, work out what the functionality of the microbiome is uh, and how the, the two work hand in hand, the human biofluid phenotype, if you like, and the microbiome composition in the gut. And of course, other areas around the body, but focusing today mainly on the gut microbiome. So I'm going to start with this wonderful review by Walla Musa and group, in uh, which was published in Frontiers in Microbiology last year. And it's, it's a really good review because it shows the good and the bad, uh, the, the, the two sides of the coin to the microbiome's influence on human health. So we know that uh, when we have uh, situations like inflammation in the body, then we see changes in molecules such as, uh, as, as butyrate, um, many other molecules too, but there's definitely a signature coming from the microbiome there. We know that the, um, the, uh, the butyrate is, is, is a known anti-inflammatory. We also know that, for example, immune cell response can also be characterized by changes in short chain fatty acids. And actually, even uh, within our body, it will make its own antibiotics. So this uh, cyclic peptide produced by nasal commensal Staphylococcus lugensis is active against methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So the body has uh, co-evolved with this microbiome and we know that it, ha it can have um, a really beneficial on health, a benefit on health. On the other side, the microbiome has been linked with various disease factors and the microbiome metabolites, particularly in this case, can be markers for certain uh, certain disease states. So, for example, cardiovascular disease has been linked with trimethylamine N oxide. That's kind of a complicated one. I'll come back to that. Autism has been associated with increased uh, 4 ethylphenyl sulfate, which is made by some clostridia and also cresols. Again, I'll come back to this later on. And then we've got things like colorectal cancer, um, where some of the microbial metabolites uh, can. Um, can uh, interact with the DNA to form an adenine adduct. So on both sides, the microbiome is active. It's, it's very helpful in maintaining uh, human homeostasis, but can also turn into the bad guy, if you like. So we need to understand a little bit more about how the hosts and microbiome talk to each other. And there's various ways of doing this. So if we th think there's a classical way of um, studying the microbiome genome itself. So uh, either looking at things like the, the 16S RNA or looking at metagenomic fecal data. And we can correlate those with various, um, various phenotypes based on feces or urinal plasma. Another way to look at the microbiome, and we can argue as to whether it's, it's a, an effective or not effective way, but still very useful, is the use of either germ-free or antibiotic knockdown mouse models. So if you have a germ-free mouse model and you transplant with a particular microbiome, can we look very closely at this system and see what the microbiome does, bearing in mind that rodents are not humans and there are still limitations of, of, of each of these models I'm going to discuss. A nice model to start at a very simple uh, level is the in vitro models, and I'll show some results on the um, bioreactors and biolog, uh, which is just a, an in vitro plate, and we can study fecal transformation of various substrates, which can also give us some idea as to personalized differences in the microbiome. And then we can actually sample directly from the intestine using, uh, using um, nasogastric flu uh, tubes and collect the fluid and collect um, the brush border, for example, in the intestine. However, obviously this is a really invasive technology and I won't say much about this today, but there's some really exciting work going on in Gary Frost's group, look at Imperial College, looking at different nutritional um, interventions with direct impact on various sections of the intestine. 
We have our own human model of looking at uh, looking at the microbiome, which is bariatric surgery, where we effectively reroute the human int intestines and disrupt the microbiome therein. And this can be quite interesting in terms of, of trying to suss out what is going on in, in different stages of the microbiome, uh, in different stages of the intestine with the microbiome host crosstalk. And then we have fecal microbial transplantation. So I will give examples how metabolic phenotyping can contribute understanding in some of these areas. So stepping back a bit, what do we do uh, in our laboratories? Well, we use mainly NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy and mass spec technologies to profile different tissues and biofluids. Basically any human sample you can take can be profiled to develop a chemical fingerprint. And we have various, um, various different types of spectrometer. And I won't go much into the technical side today, but the idea is that you put your biofluid into the spectrometer and you collect um, the, the profile, the spectral profile, which contains all the molecules, all the chemicals that can be measured by that technique in a particular biofluid. So uh, we can look at feces, we can see profiles, for example, short chain fatty acids, some of the oligosaccharides, some amino acids. However, one of the biofluids we use, tend to use um, more consistently is urine because a lot of the microbial metabolites are low molecular weight and they are reabsorbed and excreted in the urine. So we found that the urine is a good profiling base to assess the functionality of the microbiome. But you can look at any biofluid or tissue. And the idea is you generate this spectral fingerprints and then we use computational uh, pattern, recognition, pattern recognition or AI to uh, reduce down this huge amount of spectral information into various patterns that we can interrogate to see what is happening in different disease states. And then once we know what the uh, molecules are that they're interested in, in this case, we're thinking about molecules generated by the microbiome and their impact on human metabolism, we can then start to map those molecules into biological pathways. So if I just give you an example, this is a urine spectrum uh, of somebody who's been eating relatively healthily. What we can see is that each of these signals here, each of these spikes relates to a particular chemical. And in this urine profile, what we can see are chemicals coming from um, the human itself. So for example, Krebs cycle intermediates. We can also see what it directly what we've eaten. For example, um, you can see some sulfonated compounds coming from alliums or broccoli, so forth. But we can also see the transformed metabolites and microbial metabolites. And these tend to be in a particular region. If we're thinking about NMR, of, they tend to be in a particular region of the spectrum with mass spectrometry you see you can do similar things but then you can also uh, target which groups of molecules you're interested in and some of these for example might be bile acids and looking at the host microbial modulation and intrahepatic circulation of, of bile acids we could be thinking of um uh, things like phen phenols uh, coming from um, coming from uh, bacterial metabolism of dietary compounds. We could be looking at short chain fatty acids. Each of these molecules um, is produced as part of the host and the microbiome interacting to produce sort of a chemical factory of molecules which then have an impact on the human body. Some of the molecules are directly excreted, but other molecules actually are. Uh, um, reabsorbed by the human and can impact. So for example, even though the molecules are produced in the gut, we know that certain molecules such as um, the tryptophan pathway metabolites that are influenced by the, the, the gut bacteria, these can have an effect on the brain, uh, things like serotonin, 5-hydroxy uh, tryptamine. And so although the molecules are produced in the intestine, they have a long reach throughout the body. Trimethylamine and oxide, for example, is a, a dietary um, bacterial degradation product of choline metabolism. And we know that that can impact uh, adipose tissue, also heart, mus heart and uh, cardiac um, and other muscles. So although they're locally produced, these microbial metabolites do have a long reach throughout the body. 
And I just want to sort of um, start with the, in, in the beginning, obviously, understanding high throughput sequence data, really um, Rob Knight and many other pioneers, but uh, he's, he's really instrumental in producing some of the, um, the, the software we, we rely on today, things like Chime and Unifrac. And he really focused along with Suzanne Domin uh, dominguez Bello, on looking to see how the microbes develop with the developing human. So if we look at the metabolic correlate, we do know that babies, when they're born, um, are, may or may not have the odd microbe or two, but they're largely devoid of, of, of uh, gut bacteria. And as they're, expo they, they're born and they're exposed to life in general, we start to get a developing microbiome. So we know that all sorts of things affect the development of the bi microbiome, whether um, you're born by cesarean versus natural birth, whether you're fed breast or bottle, the weaning age, and, uh, age, exposure to pets, antipyretics, for example. All of these early life encounters can Im uh, impact our microbiome. And not just the microbial composition, but we also see the, um, we can follow this through in the metabolic profile. So here, for example, if you look at the top NMR trace, this is a particular region of an NMR spectrum looking at the urine. And you can see that there's quite a lot of signals in here. And these are all coming from uh, phenolics like um, paracresol sulfate, phenylacetyl glutamine, hippurate, and so forth. Now, at birth, the infant's urine resembles that of the mother's because it really is the maternal urine. But once that washes out, the, you can see in the uh, from the red trace that there's very little in here. So the gut microbiome hasn't developed and it's not producing the molecules. And then you can follow the colonization of the gut sequentially. And here's the bottom one in blue is a 14 month old child. And you can see that it's starting to develop its own microbial uh, set of signals here, things like paracrysal sulfate. Um, and this develops over the first two to three years. Now, infants who are born preterm have a different developmental pattern and on the, uh, on the right here, hand side here, what I'm showing are two, uh, are two loadings plots. It's, a, it's two different parts of the NMR spectrum showing as a, as a loadings plot. And it's showing differences between adults, young adults who were born preterm or born, born at term. We know that adults who are born, uh, so people who are born preterm or very low birth weight are more susceptible to metabolic syndrome fatty liver, and a whole series of other conditions downstream. Well, we can see that there's a metabolic memory of the birth, uh, whether you're born preterm or not, even at age 18 to 20, which is what these adults are. And the molecules that differentiate preterm versus at term are things like N-acetyl glycoproteins, which are showing uh, an increased inflammatory uh, response in those born preterm. But we can also see choline metabolites, um, phenolics like hippurate, and these are all different uh, between the term and preterm and much more pronounced in men. And they correlate with subclinical fatty liver. So all these adults are healthy, but the men who are born preterm were showing uh, signs of subclinical fatty liver and you can also see a matching NMR profile. So the microbial colonization in infancy affects, has a long-term metabolic signature, if you like. And here's another example, just a quick example. Uh, babies born breastfed compared with who are bo uh, breastfed after birth compared with those who are formula fed after birth. And the strongest differentiator between them is this molecule here, which is phenylacetylglutamine. And this involves both a host and a bacterial step. So phenylalanine is converted into phenylacetate uh, by the gut microbiome. And then the glutamine is conjugated in the human liver, producing phenylacetylglutamine. And even babies who were mostly breastfed, but just given one or two formula feeds, excrete more uh, phenylacetylglutamine. Um, so that was quite an interesting observation. Now, if we look at a pig model, which is a good model for nutrition, and we look at, um, we're looking here at two different weaning diets, they're weaned onto either egg or soy, 
And then on top of that, these two groups were given a probiotic, uh, bifidobacteria, um, a, a, a probiotic with either the egg or the soya. And then they were given a three week washout period. So no probiotics and no uh, differences in diet. They're then all weaned onto a fish based diet. So what we're looking at here is a three week pre memory of the weaning diet. And in this pig model, the largest influencing factor is not the probiotic, but actually the earliest weaning diet, which is uh, in, um, in purple, we have soya, and in black, we have the egg. And if you look at the, the loadings of the urine in these pigs, you can see that it's, uh, there are things like the Krebs cycle metabolites, for example, citrate and succinate that are altered between the two diets. But apart from those, the main discriminatory molecules are things like hip urate, indolacylglycine. Um, they are the gut microbial or gut microbial host co-metabolites. So weaning diet also has a long reach both on the, the microbiome, which we can, uh, we can also see in this next side, slide, but also the metabolites. So egg was associated with uh, various different strains of bacteria, um, and had a, a far more diverse bacterial response than the soy diet. So moving on to effect of diet now in, in later life, microbial impact on obesity, and a lot of the pioneering work in this field was obviously done by Jeff Gordon, uh, Ruth Lay, Fred Backhead, Peter Turnbaugh, and these guys showed very early on that um, there is a difference in lean and obese phenotypes in animal models, for example, in uh, the bacteroides to firmicute ratio, and the microbial composition differs between uh, lean and obese. Not always reproducibly, and I think this is because we are looking such a, at such a complex ecosystem, and when we go to different populations, different cohorts, we see slightly different things, but the consistent thing here is that uh, we can see a difference in, in bacterial signatures between obese and lean. And this is work pioneered by Jeremiah Stamler, who sadly passed away uh, early last year. In, in, um, uh, but he was the first person to link salt with hypertension. And he was convinced that nutrition in population differences in nutrition really made a difference. So he collected samples from 5,000 individuals across uh, Asia and across America and the UK. And we're looking now just at the American population. But if you take the American population and look at obese versus uh, non-obese individuals, what you see is a whole series of consistent differences in the NMR spectrum. And I'll skip to the next slide because the point here, and this is, this is reasonably old work, but the, the, the point I want to make here uh, which I think is still very relevant, is that over a third of the top discriminatory metabolites in the urine signature of obesity are coming from the gut microbiome. So things like trimethylamine, this is bacterial degradation of choline, uh, things like your hip urate, which is your, um, your benzoic acids, and then things like cresyl sulfate and, and some of the more in indels and aromatic amino acids. So the gut microbial signature is very strong for obesity in terms of the metabolic phenotype. And this is just showing you the, the uh, so I've, I've already mentioned phenylalanine's conversion to phenylacetylglutamine, but another interesting molecule still coming from aromatic amino acids is tyrosine, which is converted to paracresol sulfate by the, the gut microbiome and then sulfate conjugation in the human liver. And we know that sulfate, that, that cresols aren't produced by humans. These are things you paint your garden fence with, for example. They're coming, these are nasty compounds and they're produced by the gut, micro, uh, the gut microbes. Now, John Cryan from uh, the APC in Cork and, and many others, but John Cryan uh, stands out in particular, did a lot of work around microbes and the gut-brain axis. And a lot of this, this work's focused on short-chain fatty acids. We know that they can stimulate tryptophan hydroxylase and impact 5-hydroxytryptophan synthesis. 
Um, we know that there are differences in people who have anxiety or depression versus control in terms of their gut microbiome. And we can also see this in the metabolic uh, signature. So I want to show you a particular example now on bariatric surgery. And as I mentioned earlier, this is kind of a human its own human, our own human model of microbial modulation, because we are when we do Ruan Y gastric bi, uh, bariatric surgery, for gastric bypass, what we're doing is rerouting, moving a large proportion of the, the stomach, definitely, as with other other surgeries, but we're rerouting the intestine. So you lose the first part, the absorptive capacity and the bacteria contained in the first part of the intestine. So your food source is now landing directly lower down the intestine, and this impacts both the microbes and the metabolites. And the key, um, if we look at the uh, three different species after bariatric surgery, the rat, the mouse, and the human, they all have a similar response, both metabolically and in terms of their altered microbiome. And I'll come back to the metabolic in a minute, except to say that it's not just weight loss, because in the mouse model, you can see uh, this green, these green dots, these are coming, these are urines collected from mice who are calorically restricted to look to see is it just bariatric surgery induced weight loss that is in, that causing the changes? And the answer is no, because these green dots are uh, separating the second component, whereas you see the red dots, which are the bariatric surgery, are showing up in the first component is differentiating from the sham animals, sham operated animals. And this is telling you that at least some of the mechanisms of some of the, the effects, the metabolic effects of bariatric surgery are not mediated by just pure weight loss. Now, if we look at the bottom, these are the, uh, the 16S um, analysis of post-bariatric surgery. And for both rats and humans, we see the same thing. We see a decrease in uh, bacteroidetes and firmicutes and a massive increase in gamma proteobacteria post-surgery. If we look at the urine and fecal profiles uh, in, in the middle panel, you can just see the difference between in rats between sham operated in blue and bariatric surgery operated in red. And you can see both urine and fecal metabolite profiles are very different. Now, it's too, the writing is too small to read on this slide, but you, the, uh, the bottom left panel is showing the differential profile of urine and feces between the bariatric surgery and sham rats. And there's a whole range of molecules ranging from uh, energy-related metabolites like Krebs cycle through to indoles, uh, trimethylamine and oxide, um, and uh, different gut microbially derived molecules. So a really big part of this signature is coming from the gut microbiome. Now, one of the, the only thing I want to really point out in the feces is you get a massive increase in gamma amino butyric acid post-surgery. And GABA, as we know, if it can cross the blood-brain barrier, is neuroactive. But it's just interesting that the uh, post, post-surgery, that you get a massive increase in GABA. And if you look at the microRNA profiles, you can see that as well as uh, growth and apoptosis related pathways and G protein signaling related pathways all involved with the energy metabolism, the key differences between bariatric and non-bariatric are all to do with pathways involved in uh, neurological processes and some neurodegenerative diseases. So after bariatric surgery, the microRNA, the epigenetics shows that there is a switch in neurologically related pathways. And we can also match this to uh, people who've, who have measured cognitive differences post bariatric surgery. Now, one of the, re one of the uh, things we really want to know is can bariatric surgery impact the next generation? We alter the microbes, we produce more gamma proteobacteria, we alter the metabolites. Are these handed on to the next generation? And Kiana West, who's a postdoc in our group, did a, a really uh, great study looking at urine collected through pregnancy for, um, for women who had had bariatric surgery within the last four years versus those who did not. And I'm running out of time slightly, but just showing you the bariatric surgery in, uh, in um, cyan color versus never operated on in terms of bariatric surgery in the purple. 
all these microbial metabolites like induxyl sulfate, phenylsalglutamine, they are different consistently throughout pregnancy. And indeed, when we look at the infants, in the, particularly in the uh, ruin y gastric bypass, the malabsorptive bypass, what, uh, what you see is that the altered gut microbial metabolites, certainly phenylalcylglutamine, are, are passed on to the next generation. And we can correlate some of these metabolites, paracrystal sulfate, phenylacylglutamine, and you can see that they're related with birth weight of the child and maternal fasting insulin. So these are the metabolites that are relating to clinical effect, and largely it looks like a beneficial clinical effect, although it's way too early in the game to actually say barrier weight loss from bariatric surgery actually is helping to produce healthier babies. I think that's one step too far at this stage. Now this slides in here, jumping slightly now to look at different gut microbial functionality measured by metabolic phenotypes after different disease, uh, looking at different diseases. So if we just look at inflammatory bowel disease, um, what we found is that Although there is no difference in the gut microbiome, you can see a difference in gut microbiome between the people who have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis compared to controls. But if you were to treat these people with anti-TNF alpha therapy, you don't see any difference in the treated and untreated cohorts between, um, in terms of the actual bacterial composite, fecal bacterial composition. Yet when we look at the biofluids, the metabolic phenotypes, whether it's the urine, the plasma or the feces, what we can see is that responders to anti-TNF alpha therapy, um, bearing in mind that 30% of people who are put onto these biologics will not respond. So you have a responder, non-responder type, and we can't distinguish those between, in terms of bacterial composition, but we can certainly distinguish them in terms of uh, differential bile acids, lipids, and some amino acids, many of these relating to gut microbial functionality. So even when there's no difference in presence of bacteria, sometimes the metabolic profiles give you an indication that the mic about microbial functionality. So for example, um, you see increased finger myelins and serum feces of non-responders. We see increased ceramides and non-responders and increased triglycerides. And some of these uh, ha definitely have gut microbial modulation steps involved in their synthesis. Moving on to personalized nutrition. Um, this is an experiment done by Isabel Garcia Perez and Gary Frost at Imperial College, and it was taking people and putting them into the equivalent of animal metabolism cages. We had them in, in uh, the clinical unit, and they were sat to stay there for four sets of four days. And we fed them four different diets, ranging from very healthy, according to the WHO, eat healthy eating guidelines, down to 25% healthy, which really is equivalent of a fast food diet. And in the bottom right here, we can see there's a difference in the diet, the urine profiles coming from uh, the different diets. So these people are all cycled randomly onto the different diets. And you can tell the difference between when they're eating healthily and not healthily. So we built a model around this. So we know what healthy eating is like. We then took a number, uh, about 50 different participants, and we followed them for six months. And I'm just showing the results for two participants here. Now, if you think of our model as being 100% healthy, at the 100% point on this, this uh, axis, you should get a flat horizontal line if somebody's really healthy. Now, for the mom here, she's age 70, mostly generation, veg vegetarian. Um, she has a lot of exercise and a load of fruit and vegetable and fiber intake. She's very health conscious. All her life, she's been health conscious. And you can see that regardless of what she eats on a daily basis over these six months, she has a virtually uh, flat profile around about the 100. It, it oscillates, but it's, it's sticking up at the 
Now, her daughter, who lives in the same household, um, is reasonably healthy, but she's an omnivore. She has a little bit of alcohol. She doesn't do as much exercise. And you can see eating the same foods as her mom, she is not as metabolically resistant. And if you look at the differences between the two women, it comes down to a lot of gut microbial metabolites. And we can actually start to map, uh, map these using uh, metabolic pathways. But one of the key things was when we took our healthy versus unhealthy diet, there were actually more calories excreted in people who didn't respond well. So the gut microbial metabolites correspond to versus uh, based on bomb calorimetry measurement of the urine. Some people actually excrete high amount of calories in the urine. So uh, this, is a, this is a nice correlation shown. I'm going to skip the fecal microbial transplant because I'm running out of, of time. And I want to jump now to in vitro models. And a lot of the bioreactor research was pioneered by Glenn Gibson at Reading University, and there's different variations from them. And we're setting up uh, bioreactor systems in the lab at the minute, but we wanted to take one step back. So we wanted to know what happens if you incubate feces on single carbon sources in an anaerobic chamber. So we took these biolog plates, which are really meant for looking at soil, um, soil microbes. And what we did, each of these wells has a single carbon source. So we incubated, incubated fecal slurry from 12 different adult donors and six different adult infants on these carbon sources. So we think have things like um, fucose, we have sugars, we have amino acids, we have some antibiotic checkpoints. And so each of the each of the single carbon sources, we put the fecal slurry on and we measure it using NMR, mass spec, and we also do some pack bio sequencing, seeing which bacteria can grow, for example, on fucose and what do those bacteria produce from fucose. So it's a really simplified system. You haven't got crosstalk between bacteria and it's not realistic for humans, but it's an interesting way just to start and see what's going on. Well, one of the first things we noticed was, and we expected, was that adults and infants are slightly different. So for example, from the, fe the infant fecal slurries, if you look at the, the left-hand panel here, you can see the infants tend to, uh, if we feed, uh, if we, um, if we incubate the fecal slurry on D-mannitol, then both adults and infants will produce ethanol from this, but the infants produce far more 1,2-propane diol, or propylene glycol, if you like, whereas the adults tend to produce the short-chain fatty acids like propionate. We can see differences in the adult versus infant microbiome, so infants tend to have more Klebsiella, as you'd expect, and there's a huge amount of inter-individual variation, but we can see gross uh, similarities between the adults versus the infants. Now, chirality really matters if we take D-fucose and L-fucose and incubate the fecal slurry on, uh, on, um, on those. What you can see is that D-fucose, nothing grows, and we do not lose the D-fucose. You can still see that the, uh, the chemical signature of D-fucose in, uh, in the NMR spectra. However, if we look at L-fucose, the, uh, the starting material, the, the L-fucose is completely eaten up and there's a huge amount of production of 1,2-propane diol. So chirality does matter. And the other thing that was nice that we saw was that some individuals show really idiosyncratic responses. So if we have glutamate as the starting product, 17 out of 18 of our individuals, be it adults or infant, produce things like acetate, propionate, a little bit of butyrate, ethanol. Now, one of our adults produces, and you can see this in, glue, uh, in blue, produces GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. So quite a large amount of, of quite large quantities of GABA. Her microbes are producing GABA as opposed to some of the other metabolites. And we had another person here in yellow, an infant, I think, who's producing aspartate from the glutamate. So we can see these really idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic handling of single carbon substrates even looking at this simplified system. And there's another one, if you look at uh, the, the L-fucose, for example, we can see the, the propane dial. And this is uh, in the top right-hand corner, 
we can see for quinolinic acid, one person produces some really weird metabolites here that we haven't got to the bottom of analyzing yet. But the, me the, the basic message here is that for, for each individual, we all have bacterial metabolite, bacterial bacteria that are capable of producing some weird and wonderful metabolites given certain substrates and this might help us work out you know optimize nutrition optimize medication if we can start to understand on an individual basis who is doing what and just finally uh, with this series the biolog series even if you put them on antibiotics and here's two different ones vancomycin and astreonum and again, you can see a huge amount of individual inter individual variation. Most people, uh, the, the antibiotic will kill a lot of the bacteria, but somebody retains bacteria that are high formate producing with a high formate producing capacity, for example. Whereas in the atrionum back, uh, antibiotic, then formate production is not altered but lactate produce production is so even on antibiotics we can start to see inter-individual differences in how people handle antibiotics based on their bacteria fecal bacterial composition so just finishing um i think it's really important that the metabolic phenotyping plays a big role in in uh being able to track down impacts of the microbiome and things like obesity and other inflammatory uh, conditions I think it has a role to play in personalized medicine and nutrition workflows. We can start to think about niche areas such as bariatric surgery or pregnancy. Um, some of the bacterial profiles can almost predict how uh, drugs will be metabolized. And so we can use the metabolic phenotyping here to good advantage. I think, you know, replacement of um, uh, fecal microbial metabolism, uh, fecal microbial transplantation with bespoke culture mixes. Again, microbial, uh, the, the metabolic phenotyping can really help us work out what's going on. So I think the main message today is uh, absolutely we have to keep doing uh, sequencing of our bacteria, looking at the, the genomics and looking at other ways of functionality. But some of the really simple measurements of biofluids can also help us work out what our gut bugs are doing. And with that, I'd just like to thank uh, the people who did a lot of the work, particularly uh, Janice Sanabria, Isabel Garcia Perez, uh, Siobhan Egan, who's been doing a lot of the, the biologue work, um, Sam, Jeremy and Julian, who've been involved in, all, in, in the work up till now. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>